Um, okay. I am so, so excited to kick off our next session, um, which is storytelling for organizing and advocacy with NECA from Repower. Before I hand it over to NECA, um, I just want to give a short introduction. Um, again, we're so thrilled to welcome you, NECA. NECA is a organizer, trainer, and leadership coach um, working with several different organizations, Repower, which is how we met NECA, um, Leading Change Network, Wild Project, and more. Um, Neka was born and raised in Milwaukee, um, and Yasmin and I actually got to hear her story a couple of weeks ago. We've been taking a storytelling academy um, with Neka, and she's like our favorite facilitator. So when we found out she, sorry, don't tell the other facilitators, but when we found out she was coming to the store summit, we were super excited. Um, and some of the things that we were excited to learn about with NECA is what has shaped her journey, everything from her faith to education to her family, community, and experience with organizing and justice. And I think that learning about her journey was like the perfect way to understand why storytelling is so meaningful and powerful. Um, and I also got the fortune of getting to learn a little bit more about NECA, and I hope that you share more about this, but... I was so fascinated to learn that obviously outside of her coaching and storytelling and organizing work, she's also a lawyer who has worked with uh, domestic violence and GBV organiza organizations and survivors. And so we were so excited just to know that NECA has been an advocate for marginalized communities and amplifying voices for so long, but specifically in our space in a way that feels so resonant and relevant. Um, so Without more from me, I'm going to hand it over to you, NECA, and thank you so much for being here with us. We're super excited. Um, one quick note, I'm so sorry, I should have said this before. One quick note is that at the very end of this session, we're going to make some really um, exciting announcements about SOAR's upcoming work. So stay tuned and stick around for the last five minutes. Um, we'll be dropping an interest form for some new things that we're launching. And this session is really meant to hype you up for that. So get ready to get hyped. And with that, I'll actually pass it to you, Neka. Thank you so much, Amrita. I'm excited uh, to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation. Uh, and yeah, I want to I want to jump right in. Um, part of what calls me to this work is actually being in community with others who are exploring the way that they can actually engage with the world to change it into the one that we want to see. Uh, and so, yeah, I have a feeling I'm on the right call, um, but I want to jump in and, and, and hear from you all. So I'm going to invite some participation today um, and we'll let, let's just jump right in. I'm going to share my screen here. Or am I? Oh, okay, okay. Got it. Got it. <laughs> can y'all give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen okay and things looking Things looking like something's happening. That looks right. great. Oh, good. Sweet. Okay. Sometimes I don't know, and I'm teaching classes. I'm like, oh. they're like, we haven't been able to see it for 20 minutes. Like, All right, y'all could have said something. Could have said something. All right. So we are we are on track. Um, let me make sure I can see you all. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I want to jump in um, and just kind of share br briefly. My like I said, my name is Neka. Akubeza, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I work with a bunch of different organizations, um, but Repower is one that's very close, close to my heart um, because what they're doing is attempting to uh, reclaim power for radical change, right? They're acknowledging um, this as the goal. Uh, and particularly the mission is to build a critical mass of like, social justice movements and their leaders, right? Um, and, to, and to really think about like liberatory organizing as central to that. So they're pro-Black, like we're community collective action and abundance centric, right? And I really love that about Repower, which is why I partner with them so often. Um, and they're also building like a multiracial democracy. Like that's the goal is that like, if that's the North Star, then like, this progressive movement can actually look like how we want it to look. Um, and so I just wanna give some shout outs to Repower um, and, and yeah, go check them out, they're amazing. Uh, I also gotta give some shout outs to um, 
the two people in this photo. Anyone familiar? Drop in the chat if you recognize anyone in this photo. Maybe you maybe you recognize someone. Drop in the chat if you if you if you're oh this person looks kind of familiar. Give you a hint. Farm workers movement. Okay, I don't know. Okay, okay. They're coming in. All right. This is Cesar Chavez. And actually, the person standing next to him is this, uh, former organizing director, uh, Marshall Gans, who now teaches at uh, Harvard. Um, and he'll be the first to say that he did not invent this framework that we use. Um, but he sort of distilled a lot of his lessons over the course of his time doing organizing on the ground um, and is the reason why Repower and so many organizations like the Leading Change Network, um, you know, lean on this framework of people power change. And that's actually how I got introduced to it. So um, let's do some quick setting the ground rules and then we'll jump into some of the content because I really, really, as maybe some of the folks in the Storytelling Academy can attest, I love talking about telling your story. Um, so uh, yeah, it's actually, I'm seeing Anjali in the, in the chat share. Like it's, it's actually, I think, really important to honor the legacy, particularly um, that Black and actually Latinx and many others um, movements, you know, sourcing from all over the globe uh, contribute to this to sort of this work. Um, so I wanna just lift up um, uh, some tech expectations, uh, how I think about how we wanna hold space on this call together. I wanna encourage you all, if you're not already on video, to be on video, to turn your cameras on if you're able and you're in a space where that's safe to do so. Um, but I would really, really love it uh, to be able to see your faces because part of this work of sharing your story is actually showing who you are through words. And often that vulnerability comes through on these little Zoom boxes all over our screens when we can actually see each other's faces. So would invite you if you're willing, able, and it's safe to do so to turn on your, your video. Uh, and then of course the chat, y'all, the chat's popping, okay? The chat is where the party is. I wanna encourage lots of participation in the chat, any key learnings that are coming up or even questions. Um, and I'll, I'll rely on the SOAR team if there's something that comes up that you want to flag to me just to come off mute and say, hey, NECA, can we talk about this real quick? That's perfectly fine. Um, and then to participate, y'all, throw those emojis up, okay? Throw those hands up, throw some smiles on, you know? Um, and I want to jump into it. Um, and also, just lastly, if there are any Zoom issues, I want you to y'all to reach out to Himaji so that we can make sure that you all are actually connected with the person who can support you in the moment. So. Um, all right, y'all, let's jump in. So today we're gonna to be talking about, um, we're gonna do quick community agreements, uh, and then we're gonna learn about a leadership practice of public narrative, right? So this is not like storytelling around the campfire, although we do that often and we'll draw some lessons from that, like what we regularly uh, spend our time doing, unless y'all don't camp, in which case, maybe it's around the dinner table, I don't know. Um, but like, how do we transform what we do um, uh, almost instinctively uh, sort of this like uh, habit that we sometimes form, like you can call it implicit, right? Like what we do implicitly, how do we make it explicit so that we can actually draw on the lessons, right? From what we do by habit. Uh, and then we're gonna hopefully understand this craft of storytelling, right? Like just jump in and, get, and actually have some practice. And then we're gonna see some models and then we'll debrief our learning so we actually understand what we're taking away. Um, let's do a thumbs up emoji if y'all are with me. Ooh, okay, I'm getting the live thumbs too. All right, I will take it, I'll take it. Thank you so much for that participation, y'all. So here are some suggested community agreements. Um, oh, I see it, oh, okay, I think there was a, there was a you're with me hand and I like those. Um, all right, so I wanna invite a, a voice, uh, sometimes I call this warm calling. What that is, is uh, an invitation into the conversation, not a call out. Uh, but I see a very sort of like um, smiley face. I saw a couple smiles come this way uh, from Sylvia. And I just wonder if you would be willing to read out loud this list of community agreements on the screen. Absolutely. Thank you for the invite. Yeah. Invite vulnerability move up or move back. If you're comfortable in silence, it's time to speak up. If you're comfortable speaking, take a step back. Use the chat to add to the conversation, not distract from it. 
be respectful of everyone's experience and perspective, Vegas style conversation, what happens here stays here, challenge ourselves and assumptions, don't assume, and the platinum rule, treat others as they want to be treated. Mm. I love that. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for sharing your voice in the space. Um, so these are some general community agreements I often use in online spaces. I'm curious, just like maybe, if, maybe a thumbs up emoji if you're feeling like these are community agreements that we can agree to, meaning during our time together, we can actually embrace these, uh, these community agreements. Hands up, thumbs up, if you're, if you're with it, if you're down. All right, I'm seeing a lot come across my screen right now. I have three of the screens, so I'm scrolling. I'm seeing a lot. So um, thank you so much, y'all. All right, let, let's move on to, remember I mentioned people power change, right? This is a framework of thinking about leadership. Well, I like to think about leadership not as, like, and maybe some of y'all have heard this, like the leaders are the charismatic uh, best speakers in the room, you know, the ones at the podium, right? Have y'all heard that before? Yeah, I'm seeing some head shakes, right? Um, but I like to think about leadership as an actual set of practices. For me, that made it more accessible, right? This opportunity to say, no, like, there are some concrete things I can do in the world, and that is me exercising leadership. I can grasp it, I can practice it, and I don't have to be some certain type of person, right? This isn't diva style leadership. Um, this is like an opportunity to say, okay, well, can I tell my story in a way that moves people's hearts and minds? Can I build a real relationship with folks to connect them to each other and to myself? Can I create a team structure? Can I build the infrastructure for change? A group of people working together to accomplish something in the world. Can I create a strategy? Can I develop some strategic thinking with people um, to actually move folks into action, right? And accomplish a goal, right? This is all that organizing and leadership is. And coaching is sort of, sometimes I like to think of it, the mortar for the bricks. If these are the bricks of organizing, coaching is the mortar. It goes all in through um, uh, these practices. And so I wanna invite you all in these like 90 minutes we have together to think about our time as a campaign where you all are the resource right there at the bottom of the screen, that blue circle. And we can actually think about, we're not going to go through all these practices, but as we think about public narrative, how do we get to the goal of actually telling our stories in a way that actually moves people? So that's our hope for today. Um, but I want to move us into a pair and share. I'll flag the, the, my SOAR team uh, to support uh, creating just a, a random group of pairings. Um, and I want to make sure that y'all know each other. <laughs> um, and, and that's part of this work of telling a story. So I want y'all to share uh, in your pairs, uh, your name and your pronouns. Uh, what's your hometown? Uh, what's one hope for this training uh, today? Um, and then an icebreaker question. Now this question is, what's your earliest memory of learning to ride a bike? I wanna know who was there, what happened, where was it? And now it's okay if y'all are like, I've never touched a bike in my life. That's okay, if you're not a bike rider, that's all right. I wanna know what's your earliest memory of learning a new skill? And who was there? What was happening? How'd you learn it, right? So the, that's the question, the icebreaker question. Uh, we're gonna take five minutes and pair and share right now um, to, 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 um, to share our thoughts on these questions. Uh, and thank you so much, Imadri, for dropping that in the chat. All right. If we are ready, we can send folks into parent shares. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to open the breakout rooms in just a second. Um, if you are alone in your breakout room, then just give us a moment. We'll just reassign folks. Um, if you're still alone after a few minutes, you can come back to the room. But I'm just about to open them. One moment. Thank you all for your patience. All right. About who's in the room with you. Uh, I'm curious, I wanna like drop in the chat um, if you heard, uh, or maybe show of hands, if you heard a story that was really moving for you. You're like, what, that happened? Like you, you had sort of a, 
a surprise or a twist or something funny or shocking. Show of hands if that happened to you in your breakout. Okay, okay. Amira, I want to invite your voice in if you'd be willing to share. Hey, thanks for waving. What what was so uh what did you learn about your your partner uh in your pair pair and share? So I was with uh Sagar, um and he had a story about going down this really big hill in front of his apartment complex and going super fast and then one day turning a corner and skidding to a halt and getting up and realizing that he was perfectly fine. Mm. And so that reminded me of my wife's story who something similar happened and she was, she thought she was perfectly fine, but then uh, she was actually bleeding from her head and almost had a concussion. Oh. Uh, and she, her life was saved that day because she wore a helmet. Mm, okay, we're getting some themes around bicycle safety here <laughs> and surviving even hard things. We can do hard things. Um, and also just, I really love this theme that's coming up, especially as you shared about what Sagar said of like, oh, I can do this. That's really empowering. Thank you so much for sharing. Let's hear one more voice. I want to invite uh, Shakti, if you could share. Um, what what was, uh, yeah, what, how was your parent share? Um, I yeah, no, I uh, I don't want to share for my homie, but if she would like, Pyle, if you'd like to share a little bit, just it was a really sweet story about how she learned how to ride a bike and the conviction that her mother had to make sure that she had some kind of independence in that way. Ooh, sure. Hi, Shakti. Um, yeah, we actually enjoyed talking and it uh, this opportunity took me back in my memory lane when I was in India, Pune. I was very timid. I was actually very scared and I was not looking forward to learning how to bike. But my mom was determined. So at that time, you know, she would rent a bike. We did not own a bike at that time. And uh, she would take my uh, our maid son with us. And there were some few friends, younger kids would come with us. We would go to this school ground around and um, they all would run behind me and you know somebody holding me somebody running behind me somebody running by me and um, you know that's that's what comes to my mind if I think of learning how to bike it was an ordeal but so much fun and now in retrospect I can I realized that how my mom was so strong so determined she wanted to empower me so that's my story oh thank you so much for sharing let's look Let's shout out. We got some stories already popping up in, in our room today, y'all. Thank you so much for sharing. I think what's so beautiful about how we connect with each other is oftentimes we think storytelling is like this sort of like master craft, right? Like mythical thing that only a few people have access to. But that's not true. Like we just told our stories, even a small bit. And what do we learn? Things like safety. <laughs> we also learned some, we got some humor, right? We got some love, some community, what it looks like to support. Maybe even some drawing some lessons about our family's belief systems. We, we're all in this together, right? And that's really the power of story moments, right? Not just stories in general, bringing us into moments about when did, when did things actually happen both to me and when did I do things in the world, right? So really, really uh, wanna thank you all for sharing and jumping in. I wanna move us forward. Um, I guess it's on theme here because we sometimes like to call this the bike pedagogy um, for, for those of y'all who just shared your stories, right? When we think about storytelling, it's like getting on a bike. It's like getting on a bike. And what's the first thing you do when you get on a bike? What's the first thing that happens? drop in the chat or come off mute. What, what happens? First time ever. You are not sure if you're really going to be able to handle this machine. <laughs> <laughs> you're like a little uncertainty. And then do you go to like YouTube and like look up like bike riding theories and go to the library and check out a book on bike riding theory? Is that what you do next? No, what do, you, what do we do? <laughs> What do we do, y'all? Yeah, I'm saying put the helmet on. You just try it, right? You get on the bike. And if you fall, that's actually where a lot of the learning comes, right? You're like, oh, I got to actually balance this way now. I got to I gotta big pedal a little faster to get my momentum, right? That's part of what this practice is. It's actually, let's just get on the bike together and see how far we can ride. 
not being judgmental of ourselves or others, but actually encouraging ourselves. So I want to invite um, invite that. So I'll share a little bit of how we, I like to think about how public narrative fits into organizing. Any organizers in the room, just show of hands. Folks who would call themselves organizers, maybe some activists, some mobilizers, some folks who, who want to be with community and move and work towards change. I love it. All right, I knew I was in the right room, okay. Well, oftentimes we think about, at least I think about the organizing tradition. There's a community of people who live together, right? Como, community comes from the Latin comos, right? So it's, it's, it's really meaning you are in proximity with each other. You have community with each other, right? Um, but it's, it's rarely ever just smooth sailing for every community, right? There's often a problem or a challenge that arises. It could be something that feels small, like potholes, on my, in my neighborhood. It could be something that feels really big, like, like the segregation in my city, right? It could be so many different challenges that communities face. And the organizer has the opportunity to both step up and say, I'm gonna build constituency. And that actually comes from the Latin constare, which means to stand with, right? And so we go from just proximity to actually intentional connection. And, and how do we get there? Part of the, half the battle is stories, y'all. Actually sharing who we are in real time as a leadership practice. And we all know that that's not all it takes, right? We just stand together and then the problems are solved. That's rarely how things go, right? But when we stand together, we can actually articulate the change that we wanna collectively achieve, right? And that's part of the beauty is through our stories we can share I can envision a world where there's no more potholes. I can envision a world where our communities are more together and I see unity in community, right? There's all these things we can articulate boldly through story. And so then it's, it's rarely, like I said, ever that simple, but we get to a glimpse of our resources. Did y'all, let me just hear um, or drop in the chat. If you heard any resources just from the stories folks share with you about the first time they rode a bike, did you learn of any resources? I heard some just in the reflections. What resources came, came alive? Knowledge from your elders, absolutely. Yeah, people can help, the support. <laughs> we got REI classes <laughs> coming up, training wheels, the emotional support. Right? It's interesting and just, Le, you know, less than 10 minutes, we're uncovering these resources that are all throughout our community on this call, right? So the power of story is not simply just to move people into action, but to reveal something about ourselves, right? Um, and so oftentimes we have resources and when we get access to them, we actually can think about how to translate that into power to achieve the change, right? To take our resources and use them in meaningful ways. like. Turns out after talking to hundred people in my neighborhood, there's three people who work in construction. We can fill the potholes, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> there's a whole bunch of people who work in city hall actually oddly enough. And we can actually begin these community unity like programs, right? In our community. So there's really this beautiful way of thinking about how we share to how we change. But like I said, it's rarely that simple. Oftentimes there's opposition, right? People who are very interested in the status quo. They're like, hey, Whoa, 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 don't you go sourcing your, your pothole filling community without me because I own a business and I want to make money, right? Or I have this interest. And the, that's when we can actually think about how do we transform our resources in relationship with the decision maker, right? Um, and again, all of this is rooted in leadership and how we think about transforming our resources into power to achieve collective change. Um, so let me ask y'all, uh, let's drop in the chat. Why do we tell stories? Why do we tell them? What do you think? In, your, in our lives, in our families, why do we tell stories? Yes, to share about our experiences. Absolutely, to be understood, to build solidarity, connection, power, I love it. To share lessons, absolutely to gain support. I love this one, to make people laugh. Hey, Laura, I wanna invite your voice in and share. Um, 
why why did that one come up for you the, the making people laugh Um, I just, um, uh, I don't know. It's something that I like to do and, um, it kind of maybe like gossip too. Like it just like brings joy. Um, doesn't have any like greater need to have any greater purpose, but um, just like connection, I guess, what like other people are saying too. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I often tell stories purely for humor. <laughs> you know, it's like a way, it's a way that we connect, right? We bring and infuse joy into our relationships, right? In our spaces. Um, there's a study that uh, I think it said that 75% of the way parents teach their children is through stories, like parables and, you know, anecdotes about how how to do this thing we call life, right? It's actually quite central to how we learn to interact with the world and ourselves. And so I'll briefly share my story um, uh, from, from at least from my own perspective. Um, I know that uh, Amrita shared I'm from Milwaukee. Uh, I, I lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin most of my life. That's where I was born and raised. There's me and my uh, older brother, my parents, feel free to screenshot. I tell as many people as possible. There's like baby pictures of my brother circulating on the internet. I just feel it's my duty as a younger sister to ensure <clears throat> that the world sees those cheeks. Um, so um, anyway, <clears throat> my parents uh, actually raised me and my brother uh, in the Christian faith. My mom it, grew up in um, the Bronx and Harlem, New York. Uh, and she's the first to go to college, went on to become a physician. Um, and found her way to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, of all places, to work off some debt from, from college and med school. Uh, and my dad is from Anambra State in the eastern part of Nigeria, uh, southeast. Uh, he's Igbo, and he came to the United States for education um, and in many ways from, for a better life. Um, and yeah, they, they, they traveled on faith, right? And they tried to instill that in me and my brother. Um, they taught me actually that service to others was the best way to live out your faith. And I don't think I ever remember them saying those words though. I just like saw them live this out. I remember uh, on Sunday, Sunday mornings after church, <clears throat> excuse me, we would uh, drive down Capitol Drive, which is a street that cuts through the heart of the city of Milwaukee. And as those like green street signs would change with the words on them, uh, the street names on them, um, so would the race of the communities that we were passing as I was growing up in the most segregated city in the country at the time. And we would hop out our little green station wagon. And before my dad could really even set foot on the pavement of the parking lot, these, these men and women would run up to my dad. Um, many of them were refugees or recent immigrants and they would just hug him. They would just embrace him. And it was a sort of a solidifying lesson in my life about the work that my dad was doing at the Pan-African Community Association, which he was the president of. It was, <clears throat> it was sort of this understanding I remember getting early on that um, he wanted to spend his days like working to ensure that folks did not have the same immigration story that he had and the hardships that he faced coming to the United States. And so for me, the lesson really was maybe this whole thing, this faith thing, doesn't actually have anything to do with the four walls of this church. Maybe the worship is actually the work we can do in the community. And I remember that lesson um, solidifying. But my mom, my dad is certainly a community leader. My mom, she was like cultural queen, okay? Um, she put me and my brother in dashikis. We had the black and African art across the, like, the walls in my house. We got the African drum lessons and um, family game nights with Black History Facts bingo. And um, yeah, my mom ensured that we loved our heritage and we, and we cherished it and we knew what it was. Uh, and so when I had the opportunity um, to actually go to college, um, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison of all places. Um, <clears throat> things look really different for me, y'all. I don't know if y'all remember like those feelings when you're at home um, when you feel at home and the community like hugs you. I, I had the opposite experience when I was at Madison. It was so different from how I was raised. There were 900 black students on a campus of 40,000, right? I was going to a predominantly white institution. And I remember I said, you know what? I'm gonna be like my mom. I'm gonna be a doctor. 
And so I was on my way to an unfortunate, in my view, prerequisite for med school, which was chemistry. Oh my gosh, did not enjoy. And I remember having my backpack on <clears throat> and I was walking um, to the bike that I always rode to class. Interesting, the bikes make an appearance in my story. <laughs> um, and I remember getting to my bike and I saw that um, the tires had been slashed and actually the word nigger had been written across the frame. And I just, even right now I can feel the emotions. I remember my heart sinking, like plummeting. And I remember thinking like, this is not the first time I have seen or heard this word, but it, it sucker punched me like it was. Um, because it was just a reminder of this community that I had like learned to love. There was this constant attack on it. And I remember thinking in that moment, actually, this isn't 1965, this is 2005. Like, what would my dad do? And I don't know if y'all ever had those moments of crisis and you think about the people you learn lessons from, You're like, what would they do in this situation? And I remember actually, interesting enough, Laura, so I was curious, <clears throat> I remember, I remember my dad approaching things with humor. And I remember thinking about how he always was able to find joy in hard situations. And I thought, what would make this joyful? That was my thought. And I picked up a bullhorn, y'all. <laughs> I actually don't remember where I got it from. <laughs> I went to Library Mall, which is this mall at UW-Madison, like a sort of open space. And I just started crying out for change. And I luckily had some great friends with me. It was definitely more passion than art. And that sparked my organizing. Um, it took me on a 10 year journey of student movement work uh, where I worked around the, the campus, eventually the state and the country and even the world to many countries teaching the practice of organizing and working with folks who want to build social movements so they wouldn't have to feel the isolation that it can feel when the problems are all you see and there's no pathway to change, no clear pathway to change. Um, I definitely took a detour to Houston, Texas, which is where I live now, um, and uh, went to law school, half because I felt I had a little bug, like, I don't know if y'all ever heard that, like, oh, you're not doing enough. And then the other tap on the shoulder from my dad is like, one more degree. And both of those combined um, made me feel like I needed to go to law school. But I found real community here in Houston, which is why I stayed. Um, and I also found a real opportunity to do work inside the courtroom that actually shifted the lives of people and how they told their stories and the work outside the courtroom, right? To, to still battle the systems that we face all the time. So I'm so thankful and grateful to be in this space with you all, um, to be connecting with you all. And thank you so much for letting me share my story. Um, I got some H-Town love, uh, appreciate y'all, thank you. Um, all right, so let, let's move forward. Um, and I want I, I shared a bit about leadership as a practice, not a physician. I wonder if there's someone who would be willing to read this leadership definition out loud for us. Is there someone who, who could read with a bold voice out loud? Sure, you rang. Who does not like uncomfortable silence? I don't. Um, leadership is taking responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. Love it. All right. So let's drop. Thank you so much for sharing your voice in the space. Let's drop in the chat here. Um, what resonates with you about this leadership definition, y'all? What's resonating? Have y'all heard this definition before? Ooh, okay. What are you saying shared, this enabling others? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, Aparna, I saw you shake your head. You haven't heard this before. Is there something you would, if I would invite your voice, is there something that stands out to you as new about this leadership definition? I love that it's about um, enabling others to, to find, like it's like, it's very empowering and giving tools as opposed to leading right like our whole thing is that we lead and we like you know do it and then people follow but this is really about helping people find their own ability to shine yes. um, with the shared vision 
Ooh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's part of why I love this. I feel like I learned something new every time I, I lift it up. It's so powerful what you're what you're lifting up. Um, I'm also seeing, is it Kushali share about conditions of uncertainty? I wonder, can you share briefly how you're thinking? Why, why did that stand out to you? Um, I think so often we think about like leaders usually have a vision in place, um, but we don't name the part of they're doing this vision holding and uh, imagining under conditions of uncertainty. So I think it just felt powerful to name that. Yeah, I love that. Um, that's such a, I feel like that's such a powerful takeaway. When do, when do folks actually look for the leadership? Is it like, oh my gosh, everything's going so smoothly. Let me find out who this is. Or it's like, everything's on fire. Whose fault? What's, what's going, who's in control, right? Like when we, when we actually have like face uncertainty, as humans, like we crave certainty, right? We're like, this doesn't feel, this feels shaky. Let me get some stability in my life, right? Like we, we want to feel sort of more certain, more comfortable, right? And so part of the work is actually developing a stomach for how to navigate uncertainty and still move with people to invite them in, right? Um, and so we think about these, these three questions, right? As we think about the sort of the components, there's three components of a public narrative, the self, the us and the now. Um, and I love this. this, these are questions that were actually asked by Rabbi Hillel. So they're sort of a Jewish sage. And what's interesting is these students, Rabbi is teacher, right? Like he, I think in the second century, um, students came up to him and said, teacher, listen, um, we gotta like, what, how, do we, how do we live our life in a meaningful way? And instead of giving answers, they actually offered these three questions. And he said, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me or why me? And I'm curious, I wanna invite a voice. Um, yeah, I'm curious, um, Navneet, I'm curious if you'd, be, if you'd be willing to share your voice in the space. What, what does this question, um, what does this question mean for you? Why, why would this be an important question to ask? Hi, so thank you so much um, for sharing and being here. Um, so I think for me, if not for myself, who will be for me? It's also, I think, part of uh, you know the poem when they came for the Jews. I did not stand up because I was not. So I think everyone here is aware of that. So a lot of um, this is something we all may know, but I think putting it in practice and living by those values um, is is much more challenging for many people. And just mm -hmm. having that realization and being much more intentional yes. um, about, about this, when we're doing this work to actually make sure that we are intentional about living by those values and making sure that we are not only present, but also standing up. And if you're in a room where there's a, you know, the some community or marginalized community is not being talked about, even though you may not represent that community, it's so important for you to be that voice mm -hmm. um, for the community that's not present in that space. Mm -hmm. And that's how we lift um, each other up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's important. Ooh, I love that. I feel like you're even getting a little bit into uh, the second question. Thank you for, for sharing your voice in the space. Um, I love this question because oftentimes I think as at least as a woman of color, my own my own experience is that I don't often ask this question a lot. I, I, I often move right on to what can I do for others? And so this isn't a selfish question, but a self-regarding question, right? It's saying, if I don't understand why I'm called to do this work, how can I expect others to have that same knowledge as well? Like, don't I have to know me first before I can invite and connect with others, right? And so that's part of this and then the second question, if I'm only for myself, what am I, right? And I think this part, this part is saying, hey, it's not all about you, but if I'm going to be a who and not a what in the world, I got to connect with other people. I have to recognize my liberation is tied to other folks. I have to see how I connect, right, with other folks. And then this, this question of now. If not now, when? Where have we heard this before? Stacy? do you have a thought? Where have we heard this question before? If not now, when? Uh, 
in the last 30 seconds, my kid was texting me from the other room. So I'm answering him. I'm so sorry. No worries. No worries. It's maybe a very great example of if not now when. He's, <laughs> he's asking for things and I'm like, I'm working. Sorry. <laughs> So we're getting a live example of a story of now. Okay, there's some urgency I'm hearing uh, from the text message. Anyway, I, I feel like part of why I love to lift up this, if not now, when, is if I know myself and I'm connected to others, but I, I'm not tied to the urgency in the moment to actually think about how I might change things in the world, then all I've done is really know myself and know others. But we haven't conspired to do collective action together. And that's part of this leadership practice. Um, and so I don't know if y'all have ever heard of the moral philosopher, Jerome Bruner. I love how like he actually frames, like there's two ways of knowing in the world. Have y'all ever heard that? Like with your heart or with your head? Um, this idea that like uh, some of us, maybe you've got your emotions on your sleeves. Um, you're, you're, you think with your heart first. And there's others, right, who are very like, but let's pull out the spreadsheet. Okay, let's make sure, right? Like sometimes uh, if you've ever been on a vacation with the two different types, like I've got a friend who's like all heart. They're like, we're going to land and see who we see. And my other friend's all head and is like, first of all, we're going to check in. Okay, then there's four o'clock. We're going to have dinner. Okay, because this place closes. And then we got, right? And so, that, so there's the two different, right? Like we're going to flow and, and not, and not to say that either is wrong, but that they're different, right? And part of the work of inviting um, heart work into this, right? The uh, pathos or how we experience emotion is in some ways actually letting go a little bit of staying in our heads, right? So if there's any head folks, I wanna invite y'all to travel down right here to the heart space, um, because that's actually where we experience emotion and feeling. Just a quick show of hands, did anyone experience any emotions when, you heard my story? Yeah, I'm seeing some hands go up and some, some chats. Yeah, what in those moments of feeling, I'm curious, what were those feelings? You wanna drop those in the chat? What were the feelings that you experienced through like, and it doesn't have, it can be some, several of them, but yeah, like what were this, what were these feelings that you experienced? I, I see anger, I, I see a, tight, a tightness in my chest, frustration, yeah. A sinking feeling, yeah, mourning, connection. Was there any joyful feelings in my story? Did anyone walk away like, oh, wow, this is, huh. any hope that you felt? Yeah, yeah, I've seen the, <laughs> the frustration. Yeah, okay, I'm, oh, there's interesting bravery. There was some joy. Okay, there's some hope. All right, part of what's interesting about this, y'all, is what, what values do you think those emotions we're reacting to in my story. What values do you think they'll shed light on? Like when you're like, wow, I feel so much joy, or oh, I feel, I feel so sad. Like, what what were these values that you think are present in my story? Okay, so fighting for injustice, I see a partner sharing. What else? Like, yeah, collective and community care and support finding your voice, absolutely, right? There's so many, and I agree with these, of my story, yeah, absolutely, those are core values of mine. Um, what's interesting is, I love this slide, that our values actually show up through emotion, which is why it's so important to have a, a heart space, right? To have a place where we can actually experience our emotions together, right? So oftentimes, like so, sometimes I share um, this story about my little cousin, Mikey, he was three years old and he came home one day and he was like, yeah, listen, someone's been making fun of me for liking Dora the Explorer and not Bob the Builder. And I like, I basically got a problem. And I was like, Mikey was three. I was like, if y'all can imagine the, the heart wrench and break that I felt. I was like, you better like Dora the Explorer, okay? And I was like, if Mikey would have asked me, I would have pulled up on that playground. Like, point them out, point them out, you know? <laughs> What's interesting is I have a value of don't mess with my little cousin, right? <laughs> I have a value of protection and family and wanting to make sure that this young, this young boy can actually live out whatever he wants to do, right, in his life. If it's loving Dora the Explorer or Bob, Bob the Builder. What, what's interesting is, my emotions gave insight to my value, right? Does that make sense? It was connected. 
And that's often the case, right? You might watch a commercial and says, hey, littering is really bad, let's recycle. And you're like, oh, that seems interesting. Then you go outside, maybe you're at the park and someone just crumples up some paper, throws it. You're like, what? <laughs> you know, what's go? come on, right? And it, it can be something small. You're like, oh, I do care about that. I care about this earth and what we do to it. Like even in a small example. And so part of this work is saying, how do we transform these emotions that we feel and move them from, from the isolating experience to sort of active motivators, right? So instead of feeling inertia, when you heard my story, you're like, wait, we got, what are we going to do, right? <laughs> when I heard Mikey, I didn't feel like, oh man, what, whatever could we do? I was like, say the word, Mikey, we're pulling up on the playground, right? I, I didn't like, what, sometimes we can feel fear and that's isolating, right? Like that can inhibit us, right? Um, as opposed to feeling hope. And it's interesting in a story about sort of racism and racial bias in my story, you can still walk away feeling hopeful that there's going to be a better world, right? It's really interesting, the power of our emotions. And so I love like, how we can go from apathy to anger, right? Or maybe from self-doubt to, has anyone heard ICMAD? You can make a difference. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's essentially saying, I don't think I can do anything to, we can do something together, right? Um, that's the power of emotions, right? And I love this part about anger. I, it's, not, it's not actually blind rage, right? It's like a righteous anger to say, I'm so upset, I'm gonna do something about it right? I'm so disturbed, right? And, and oftentimes people hear my story and they're like, who, who did it? You know, <laughs> they're like, what, what's going on, right? You feel that bubble up in you and that might be a signal to your own values. And that's the power of sharing your story. Is this clear for folks that's coming through in terms of how we connect? Okay, I'm seeing some head nods. All right, so then what makes a good story, y'all? Let's maybe build a story together. Let's build a story together. Um, so let's just say, I'll take me for example. I woke up this morning, I fed my dog, I came down to my computer, sent a couple of text messages to the SOAR team, and then I logged on and now I'm here with you all today. Is that a, that's a good story? Blockbuster, Netflix special, Aparna's giving me the like, ah, Rotten Tomato score of 20%, maybe, I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> what, what would make this story better? What would make this story like a, a good story? Okay, <laughs> we need to see the dog. Okay, once a, okay, so let's say you all saw the dog um, <laughs> who often makes some guest appearances on my Zoom. He thinks you all are his friends. Um, and yeah, what, what would make this story um, like actually a really good story, a better story. Help me, help me tell it. Why don't we add like sort of mad lib it here? Why don't we add like a section of my story? What what happens to me, y'all? Let's co-tell it. Okay, upon of saying something I overcame. Would you be willing to come off mute and share? What did I what did I overcome in this story that we're sort of making up together? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's self-doubt or, um, you know, something that would inspire us, like any kind of emotions or fear or something like that. Something that yeah. So, what would you invent just as a as sort of a, a game we'll play? What how would you what would you add to my story to make it a, a better story? Oh, I don't know. I don't know your story. <laughs> okay, we're making it. We're making it up. Um, Adding to the frame. <laughs> Let's just say, you know, since this is a South Asian space of like, how do I make my story relevant? What can I bring to the table? How do I bring the community? Like there could be fears and emotions around that. Not that I'm- Okay. Through, but All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna move with it. Okay, so I woke up this morning, I came down the stairs, I fed my dog and then I was like, oh man, how am I gonna make my story relevant to this particular community? And I thought about it, I was like, okay, got some thoughts down, checked in with my team, I logged on. And now I'm here with y'all. Is that a better story? Is it still, would we say it's a good story? Oh, I'm seeing Sylvia say spice it up with some vengeance. What do you, what, what would you add to the story? And again, we're just playing. I, I have something. I yeah, have something. 
So you came down and you watched the news and there you see on the news that the president has said that your parents cannot, they are banned to come to your country to see you and your grandkids um, ever. And oh, you shoot. feel a lot of anger and emotion and passion and you are like, you know, you scream. Oh man. Because you're so, never going to see your parents and your kids won't see your grandparents just because the president said so. Oh, shoot. Okay. So this story is getting juicy. All right. So I wake up in the morning. I'm like, all right, got to feed the dog. And I'm like, wait, let me check the news. The news got this story. Oh, shoot. Like, I'm never going to see my parents again because like, one man said so. Like, what kind of foolishness? So I'm like upset. I'm reeling in pain. I don't know what's going on. Okay, then what happens to me? What happens next? How do I get here? How do I get here in this calm sense? Like, what, what's the resolution to this challenge? You build a movement. Ooh, so I built a movement, a movement in, in a matter of minutes. And all of a sudden, <laughs> my parents, they, they're, they're able to overcome this really bogus administrative policy. They get to the U.S., everything's okay. And I'm like, ah, oh, whoo. All right, let me log on. Everything's okay. Let me log on. Okay, so that, that is our story. We're going to pause there. Thanks for participating, y'all. So what made that story more interesting? What made the story, the, the set, this last story from the first? What do we do? Feel free to drop in the chat. Yeah, it's interesting. It's not just challenge, but it's an unexpected challenge. Something, uh, thank you for sharing that, Laura. Yeah, like there's, a, there's sort of this climax, this drama, right? That's part of the craft of storytelling, y'all. It's not, it's not to say that we invent conflict, right? But that we acknowledge it actually exists all throughout our lives, right? Show of hands if you ever face a challenge, right? Show of hands if you ever experience pain, right? How about joy? How about everyone logged on this call today, despite any and all of that? It's interesting, right? When we start to frame how we think about our lives trajectory, as moments building on moments, right? And so, you know, as a sort of silly example, that's one way to think about a story structure, right? That there is some sort of protagonist, us in this case, who come and meet a challenge. There's some sort of outcome that occurs and we learn something meaningful about that. I guess in our, our fake story example, we can take away a couple of things like, whoa, NECA can type really fast, like be able to solve this problem or wow, she's not going to give up, right? Like there's some takeaways maybe that we can learn from the way that we structure this. Um, so I'll move us forward. So um, these pieces work interconnected, right? There's a story of self, there's a story of us, and then there's a story of now, right? Um, an opportunity for you to think about why am I called? Why can we make the difference together? And what could we do out in the world at, at, through action to actually see it come to fruition? So we're gonna see an example. I wanna show this example of a friend of mine named Mong, um, Mong Mu, who, um, yeah, shares a story, a linked narrative is what we call it, where the components of story of self, us, and now are all present in the story. And I'm very interested in you all taking taking a look as you're looking, uh, as you're watching, uh, to see when do you hear those individual components um, in his story? Uh, what values threads run through this story? What can you see that Mong actually values? And then what are the details or images um, that bring these stories alive? And then of course, what's the ask? What does Mong actually ask folks to do? So um, let me, hold on, let's see if I can do this well. I've been trying to, I should practice sharing my screen earlier. All right, here we go. Let me know if you all can hear this. It was an afternoon on a bright sunny day. Suddenly, a gunshot rang out and a villageman shouted, run, run, military is coming. I was only seven. I ran to my parents and who were following a long line of villagers fleeing into jungle. We climbed. Oh, Neka, we can't hear it anymore. I think because you went. The village is burning in flames. I kept asking, why? 
I'll rewind it a bit. And I look back. I was only seven. I ran to my parents and who were following a long line of villagers fleeing into jungle. We climbed up and down the hills, stopping only to catch our breath. Then I look back. I saw our entire village is burning in flames. I kept asking, why someone is burning down our homes? And why no one in the world is helping us? I didn't know it then. Our tribe was the target of a brutal military campaign. I was born in a nomadic mountain tribe in the remote villages of Chilevang Hiltrex, near the border of Bangladesh and Burma. When I was nine, I witnessed my own uncle gunned down by the military. When I was trembling in fear, my mother pulled us aside to the corner and said, I must get out of this hell. When I asked how, she said, education was the only way out. I do not know what education meant to you when you were nine. But for me, education meant I will end up shot there like my uncle. Education enabled me to get admission in the University of Hawaii in the US. And because of that, I was able to flee war zone and receive political asylum in the US. Education is my passport to life. In 2005, I went back home to see my ailing mother. It was humiliating to see our villagers are working as a day laborer for the people who stole their homes and their lands. I also met a little boy, Omsi, seven years old, aloof, shy, and homeless. Think of what you are doing at seven, coloring pictures in your classroom or playing in your backyards. For Omsi, both of his parents are shot dead. Instead of carrying books, he carried bricks. Instead of playing house, he cleans house for 35 cents a day. I saw scars in his face, and I imagine the scars in his heart. This is injustice. I had a second chance in life. Omsi deserves one too. So I used my entire life saving of 63,000 and opened a school for elementary school for orphan children. Now, you may not have experienced atrocities like Hong Sing, but I think we all know how it feels like to be powerless at times when all odds are stacked against us. In those darkest hours, someone, somewhere, opened our eyes and gave us glimpses of hope. From our class, I remember Mary from the Divinity School, say from the light industry, or Oscar from the Harvard Kerry School, a mentor helped him to break the cycle from the gang infested neighborhood. Through education, we can open eyes, give hope, and save life for children like Hong Si too. Today, Hong Si is in the fifth grade in our school, and he dreams to be a teacher someday. But after fifth grade, he has nowhere to go. I use my entire life saving to build the elementary school. So I urge you to join me to build a secondary school. For Hong Si, the time is now. We cannot wait, and Omsi cannot wait. We need to raise $10,000 to build classrooms. Between Harvard Kennedy School and Graduate Edu School of Education combined, we have 1,600 students. And we all, all need to donate $7 each to build that school. Two Harvard schools can come together to build one school for orphan children. Imagine what a powerful message it sends to the world. This is not a charity. What we do here today is empowering people to serve their communities for generations to come. If you believe as I do, a child doesn't have to grow up in the same darkness as he or she was born, or it is better to light a candle than to curse the darkness, I urge you to join me on November 11th at Elliot Lyman Room, Graduate School of Education to organize a fundraising event. If our Harvard education is meant to help those who are afflicted by injustice, raise voice for those who has no voice. Let us be true to their cause. Let us free these children from the shackle of child labor. And let us send a message of hope to Angsi that he's not alone, he matters. We believe in him, we support him, and he can indeed be a teacher someday. 
and Southeast communities. Thank you very much. All right, y'all. I'm gonna give it up for Mong, um, sharing story. Uh, so we're gonna just take maybe two minutes here just to quite, kind of debrief and then we're gonna pivot to actually an opportunity to work on our own stories here. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, oh, come on. Come on, technology. There we go. All right. <laughs> Hopefully y'all are seeing uh, Mong's beautiful face and some questions on the screen, sweet. So yeah, wh where did we where did we hear the story of self and Mong's story? Where do we hear that, y'all? And feel free to drop in the chat. Yeah, I was actually right at the beginning, Sagara. I'm curious if you would share briefly, what do you remember hearing moments of self in, in Mong's story? Thank you. Um, I just remember from the story it, it starts immediately in what he was experiencing in that moment, you know, like fleeing from the village, seeing what was happening, and it immediately tells you like who he is, what his past kind of was. Mm, I love that. Yeah. It's interesting, the power of a moment, right? Especially when it's descriptive, that it can actually shine light on so many other things going on around us. Um, so really, really powerful, right? We get, we start with a story of self. Um, and then we get into this element of the story of now. Did y'all hear that? What was what was so urgent that Mong was talking about? What was what was the urgent challenge that Mong was inviting us to collectively face? Yeah, the secondary school, right? For Ong Singh, right? There was like uh, this really vivid imagery. Y'all remember this phrase? Um, like Ong Sing should be carrying books, not bricks, right? Y'all remember that? Right, it's op opportunity in the craft of storytelling to like connect how we think about descriptors, right? Like, oh, I wanna say that Aung Sing should be in school. How do I say that? Oh, you know what? I'll say what he's doing now and what I think he should be doing. But he didn't say Aung Sing's really having a hard time. I hope that you all care. I was like, imagine it. You're carrying books. Are you carrying bricks and not books? All of a sudden, you get a glimpse, you never met on Singh. I've never met on Singh. And it's so interesting, right? Like the power of these words and these descriptors. Um, so, so something to, to think about. And then what about the story of us? Was that present in, in this? Yeah, I'm seeing some head nods, right? Mom was reaching out to the people in his class saying, hey, I, like there are people who've done this before. People saved from the life in the street, people who have persevered. We can do this, y'all. Right, and it's opportunity to connect with folks in the room. Um, and then, what did what did um, Mong ask? What did Mong ask us? Was it like, "Give me your money, and then I'll be good. I'll go do it." Yeah, it was actually join him in a fundraiser. Right. Sometimes I call it a "you go do" versus "join me in." Right sentiment. It's the join me in that makes a collective and more powerful and draws on the people's resources. Um, so I just wanna, just wanna name that. Um, okay, so I wanna move us forward because there's actually another example um, where we think about like the story of self, right? Um, and this opportunity, we're gonna focus on that today. We're not gonna write a full link narrative, but just have you all, I wanna invite you all to write a story of self and to do so, we're gonna kind of put in some parameters the story of self is really your call to leadership. This is where you begin to ask the questions, where did I first learn to care? Where did I first learn to, to fight? Where did I first learn my values, right? Um, and I wanna give you this like example of a woman named Amal Bedoun from Michigan. Um, and she shares a story and I want y'all to keep in mind where you're hearing the elements of the story in this model, um, where's the source of hope, and what are the details, images, or moments that actually bring this story alive? All right, so we're gonna take just a quick look um, at Amal, uh, and then we'll have an opportunity to do some writing and some sharing of our own stories. So here we go. Hopefully this audio is working okay as well. Let me know if it's not. So it's January 4th, 1998. I think it was a Sunday and I was 16. All my friends were getting ready to go back to school after winter break. They were worried about papers, ACT, college choices, 
spring sports. I was in a hospital bed holding my newborn baby girl. My journey to becoming a teenage mother was long and tiring and scary. My dad had been killed seven years before that as he worked for the United Nations in Lebanon. And he was killed on the job in the Civil War. Becoming a war orphan for me in all kinds of circumstances that the ambitious, strong, determined me would not have ever placed myself in. I was in that hospital bed feeling like I was a loser. My life was over. I was somebody with no high school education who's now in charge of raising a child. And I felt so sorry for myself and my baby because I'm helpless. And what do I have to offer? I looked at her and she looked at me with this look, like you are the most powerful person I know. I'm the only person I know. <laughs> and at that moment, I realized that victims can only raise victims. Helpless people will only raise helpless people. And people with no choices will only raise people with no choices. And that's not what I wanted for my child. At that moment, I decided I would no longer call myself a war orphan. I will no longer be a person who allows things to happen to them. I will make choices for me, for my daughter, and for any woman who finds herself placed in circumstances that are out of their control. All right, y'all, got to give it up for our mom sharing from the heart. Actually, during a workshop exactly like this one, um, where she shared her story for the first time um, in under two minutes, surprisingly. Um, so what we're what we're gonna do is we're gonna have an opportunity to write out two minutes stories of self. But I want to just kind of unpack the Amal story. So what was the challenge, y'all? What was the challenge in that story? Feel free to drop in the chat. What was there a challenge? How did how does she frame it? Feeling helpless and hopeless. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It was actually losing her father. Like, thank you for sharing in the in the chat, right? Like this feeling of helplessness. And not only that, but she became a teenage mother and named that as a real challenge for her right? It's not something she ever imagined for herself, right? And so it was interesting, like the choice of words, not an indictment on teenage mothers, but a, a statement of saying, I wanted something different for myself. And I found myself in a hospital bed at 16, right? And it's not saying broadly, right? It's bringing us into the moment, right? And all of this after losing her father. And then what's the hope though? Is it all challenge? Is it like, oh, we feel sorry for them all? Or is there hope in this story? If you feel like there's hope, drop in the chat. What was hopeful about this, this story? Yeah, her baby's face brought her hope, absolutely. Yeah, she decided she wanted more. She made a choice, right? Um, she could be a positive force. Her baby made her feel powerful. Any guesses on what Amal does to this day? Amal's based in Dearborn, Michigan. Spoiler alert, she, she, she's not a doula, but that would be something that, she is an organizer and she's also a social worker. She works with young women and girls. This story maybe give you a hint as to why that's one choice she made for herself, right? So it's a part of understanding our calling. That's what this story of self is all about. Um, thanks so much y'all for, for letting me share that. So um, what I wanna do is invite you all to take five minutes right now, just to develop your own story of self. Thinking about telling versus, or show, showing versus telling. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we call it mentions versus moments, like saying I had dinner versus sitting at the dinner table, granny spilled the gravy on the tablecloth per usual, little cousin Mikey was sitting in my brother's lap, right? Like all of a sudden you're transported to my dinner table, right? So that's the hope, right? Is we're gonna do moments versus mentions. Um, so I wanna invite you all to show, not tell, um, to write your first two minute story of self. Uh, so take five minutes right now. 
Um, and I've got some of this up here just to help uh, support you all as you're thinking about writing. So feel free to go off camera while you're writing if that helps. I wonder if I can get some, let me see if I can cue up some background music here. Y'all hear that? Yes. If when you're sharing your screen, you put share sound, then it won't mess if you mute yourself. Oh, okay. I'll just keep quiet. I'll keep quiet. All right, y'all, we got one more minute left.
All right, y'all, that's our time. That's our writing time. Hopefully it was peaceful um, and productive. Uh, so what I would love to have happen is I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna invite a brave soul um, to just give us an example of, a, of, their, of your two minute uh, story of self. Um, I wanna invite, uh, yeah, someone, one person just to share, to just to give an example of after five minutes, um, how we can turn a first draft uh, into the next draft and the next draft. So um, challenge by choice, but I wanna invite someone to raise their, their emoji hand if you're willing to just share. Um, what's called you to, to leadership? Oh, I saw a hand go up. Dr. Nisra, are you willing? Yes, 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 I will. So oh, what I want to share is, you know, <laughs> the story that I spoke to you uh, when I was uh, uh, yeah. about learning swimming, right? Yeah. Um, okay. At the so age of six. Before you like, jump in, before you jump in, I'm gonna put my timer on the screen just so you can know how you're how you're how you're pacing. You'll have two minutes to yes. share your story. So over to you. Yes. So when I was like uh, uh, put 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 in the deep end, uh, as per my parents, that's how you learn to swim, which I didn't do with my two sons. I put them in YMCA. But that moment, that moment where I. As a child, I knew how to survive. And then I learned swimming. And I feel when I grew up, that moment of survival actually made me a, you know, a brave person because I, I, I became a victim of domestic violence. I came out as a survivor and I am a thriver. And I feel that moment of helplessness actually if others think that it was not it was actually gave, gave me the power to rise up and do the impossible make it possible so here i am today as a thriver wow with a minute to spare everyone let's um give some emoji claps some snaps some love in the chat to dr misrat for sharing um her story of self um, just a few takeaways here. One, I'm grateful. I loved how you brought us into a moment, right? Sometimes we hear stories self, I gotta have my whole story, my whole life in two minutes. You said, no, there's this moment. I was pushed into the deep end and it taught me resilience, right? It taught me, it taught me how, how to survive. And later in life, you shared vulnerably, and I'm so grateful um, that you came out as a survivor. And how powerful to connect dots, right? To say, I'm not the worst thing that's happened in my life. I'm actually, this is where, this is where my story begins, right? It's actually here early in life where I first learned these lessons. Um, so I just wanna say thank you so much for sharing your story. I know we probably have a lot more stories to share, um, but we're at the end of our time. I wanna invite you all to continue to share your stories, continue to use this as a leadership practice in your spaces. Um, and I hope that our paths uh, cross again very soon. Thank you for letting me share. Uh, and I want to pass the mic uh, back to my SOAR team, to Amrita and others uh, to close out our space together. So thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Neka. And thank you everyone for participating. Um, I really appreciate you, Neka, for sharing your story with us, for building a story with us that was fun and silly, and just for being vulnerable and, and teaching us so much. I just had the pleasure of taking the Storytelling Academy with Neka. So I know that this was like just a glimpse of how much you can grow through storytelling. And I really appreciate the coaching that you gave me and the care and wisdom that you brought to this space too in SOAR. So I hope we definitely have our paths crossed again. Um, and if you all can, please show some love for NECA in the chat because that was an amazing workshop. But I'll pass it to Amrita to talk about some exciting next steps and, and things that are coming up. Perfect. You can just go straight to the next slide so we can get right to it. Um, very exciting news, just building off of what we just said, is we're actually gearing up to host a full storytelling academy. So for those of you that were itching to share or want to keep working on your stories, this is exactly what we aim to do. Um, we're still in the works of planning it. And so what we'd love to ask for you to do today is actually just complete an interest form. Um, and the big, big news after that is sort of... Um, 
what we're gearing up for to release in the fall is Source for Storytelling Anthology. This builds on our work with collecting abortion stories, our woven voices zine, and both of our research reports to date. And I think as a team, what we feel has been missing is like the heart of some of those findings, the heart of some of those data points, which is with all of you um, and your clients and your peers and friends and family who want to share their stories. And so we invite all of you, but you can also see in the forum that you can fill it out on behalf of um, a family member who might be interested or a client who might be interested, and then we'll follow up with you. Um, I know we're about to go to break. We'll leave this slide on maybe for a couple of minutes. Um, the interest form is in the chat. There's a lot of information in the interest form itself, but I will also be here for questions. Um, just a quick note is that the Storytelling Academy, hopefully, fingers crossed, will be hosted by Repower, which is and NECA hopefully will be our lead facilitator. So that's kind of what we wanted to like plant the seed for and give you all a taste of today is like, if you want to keep working with NECA, learning from her um, and learning from Repower, the Storytelling Academy is the perfect place to do it. Um, I'm seeing one question in the chat. Does someone need to be a SOAR member to participate? That's a great question. And no, we um, do not require you to be a SOAR member to participate in either of these offerings. Thank you for the question. Um, okay, so we will start the break timer coming back at 15 after. Is that right, Himadri? Can you give me a thumbs up? Great. 15 after, whatever time zone you're in, we'll leave.